One of the most common concerns that I hear from people who are contemplating a psilocybin journey is, what if I have a bad trip? And it makes total sense. Nobody wants to have a traumatic experience that not only leaves them without the benefits that they had hoped for, but could leave them worse off than where they started. Hi, I'm Dr. Tracy Kim Townsend. I'm a licensed medical doctor and psilocybin facilitator, and I teach about the healing potential of psychedelics. When people talk about a bad trip or negative experiences, they're usually describing one or more of the following. Fear, confusion, emotional overwhelm, or a sense of losing control. These kinds of trips are more likely to arise when there is a lack of safety. Care probably wasn't taken in preparation, set, setting, and integration. And when these things are tended to properly, the likelihood of a so-called bad trip diminishes. Now, that doesn't mean that parts of the trip aren't uncomfortable or challenging. In fact, it's facing off with the most uncomfortable aspects of our psyche that allows for some of the deepest healing to take place. There is no real growth without growing pains. In this video, we'll explore the 10 most common challenging experiences that can arise on a psilocybin or psychedelic journey when they happen from both a neuroscience and a psychospiritual perspective and how to prepare for, navigate, and integrate them. And before we dive in, I just wanna say that over the course of several of my own psychedelic journeys over the past 10 years, I've experienced every single one of these experiences myself. And that's actually been essential for my own training to know firsthand what these states feel like so that I can support others if and when they arise. Now let's go through those 10 most common challenging experiences one by one. The first up is paranoia or panic. This is often a transient misinterpretation fueled by heightened suggestibility and sensory distortion. Thoughts like, am I part of a setup? Or why does my guide suddenly look like someone else? Can arise. It's the mind grasping for control in a state where control is dissolving. Which brings us to the next most common experience that is challenging, fear of losing control or feeling like one is going insane. Common thoughts include, I broke my brain, or what if I never come back? These moments are when the ego or the structure that keeps our world predictable starts to soften and dissolve. And the good news is that for those who have gone through proper screening, we know that the trip always comes to an end. You always come back from the journey into your default state of consciousness. Next, we have fear of death. Ego death can feel like physical death. The boundaries of the I or the self fade and the psyche can interpret that as dying deeply uncomfortable and profoundly transformative and liberating when we surrender to it in a well-prepared and well-supported environment. Next, we have time and space confusion. Your sense of time can unravel. You might not know who you are, where you are, or how long you've been there. Did I already do this? Or is this real life? Is this still the trip? These are signs that the linear narrative has temporarily loosened. Similarly, time distortion can make minutes feel eternal, like forever. But it never is, at least in Earth time, like I said, the trip always ends. Next up, we have thought loops or looping, getting stuck, replaying the same idea, emotion, or memory over and over. This is actually happening all the time for anybody who struggles with chronic anxiety or depression. The best way out of a loop is to stop resisting it, to breathe, feel your body, and allow it to complete. We also have strategies as facilitators, such as changing the music or changing your environment. Next up, we have resurfacing of old trauma. Memories of grief, loss, or abuse can arise. This is the nervous system doing the work it wasn't able to do before, finally completing the loop of what was too overwhelming to feel at the time. This can often be accompanied by cathartic releases. And again, being with somebody who is well-trained and supporting people through these experiences is crucial. Next is emotional flooding. Intense waves of sadness, anger, or shame can feel like too much or a bottomless well. But this is the mind and body releasing years of repressed emotion. Trust that on the other side of this heaviness and contraction is lightness and expansion. Next, we have disturbing visuals. Faces can appear distorted, environments can feel dark or menacing. These visions often mirror inner fear and not external reality. Next, we have what I call the void. This is a deep sense of isolation, being cut off from everyone and everything, what some people describe as cosmic loneliness. 
Many who come back from this experience realize how deeply interconnected we actually are in real life here on Earth and that we were just cut off from it before. And finally, we have fear of vomiting. This one's so common. Intense physical sensations brought on by the flood of serotonin in our system, including our gut, can lead to tremors, sweating, chills, nausea, and yes, vomiting, all of which are actually harmless but can feel overwhelming in the moment. So why do these experiences happen? From a neuroscience perspective, psilocybin quiets our default mode network. This is the neural pathway in our brain that maintains our usual sense of self and ego defenses. By quieting it down, it dissolves the habitual patterns, including self-critical thought loops and rigid narratives that keep us stuck. While tremendously liberating, this process can feel deeply unsettling and destabilizing. Our mental safety nets and ego defense mechanisms are falling away, leaving us temporarily exposed. And this can bring on uncomfortable projection, like seeing our inner critic in others, or feeling that the room itself is hostile or judging us. But this too is medicine because it reveals the unconscious patterns shaping how we relate to the world and our reality. These experiences are already part of our everyday state of consciousness. We just get to examine it under a magnifying glass to see what is capital T true and what is delusion. When it loosens, suppressed emotions can come forward. That's why we may feel fear, panic, or grief, particularly if we've been suppressing these feelings for a long time. From a psycho-spiritual perspective, this is our psyche's way of bringing shadow material into the light. These moments are like lancing an abscess, painful in the moment, but essential for healing. Sometimes we need to feel our fears magnified many times to realize that it was all an illusion in the first place. When there's poor preparation, unsafe environments, or lack of support, the experience can spiral into confusion or terror. And this is why, I'll say it again, preparation, dosage awareness, professional guidance, all of these things matter so much, especially if you have any sort of trauma in your history and you're new to psychedelics. When people say, I had a bad trip, they usually mean some combination of these experiences. Oftentimes the phrase bad trip though actually isn't really accurate and it's sometimes more accurate to say, I had an intense trip. If we look across mythology and psychology, descent into darkness is a recurring theme of transformation. Joseph Campbell called it the cave you fear to enter, and Carl Jung called it shadow work. In every hero's journey, there's a descent before the return with wisdom. So rather than labeling these experiences as negative, we can see them as necessary, our psyche's initiation into wholeness. So how do we work skillfully with these experiences when they arise? One, we can practice mindfulness. Meditation trains the same muscle that helps in psychedelic states, which is the ability to observe thoughts without becoming identified with them. At Johns Hopkins, researchers found that people with meditation experience report more feelings of love and openness and fewer feelings of panic and isolation during their experiences. Two, we can use breath as our anchor. When things feel overwhelming, focus on the exhale. Each breath is a reminder that I'm safe, and this is temporary. Three, surrender, don't resist. When we fight what's happening, we suffer more. When we soften into acceptance and say, this too shall pass, the storm begins to shift. Four, remember gratitude. Even a small memory such as a loved one's face or a sunrise can reconnect you with the beauty and goodness of life. Five, express yourself physically. Tears, movement, laughter, shaking, these are all welcome expressions. They're releases. Your body knows how to complete what your mind cannot. And six, trust the process. No experience lasts forever. Just as the music changes, so will your inner landscape. And finally, trust your facilitator. They are there to remind you of these tools, like your breath, your body, your intention, to help hold the container until you safely return from your journey. Look, a challenging experience that's left unprocessed and unintegrated can be traumatic, but a challenging experience that's shared, reflected on, and mined for the wisdom that it contains can become one of the most transformative events of your life. 
Remember, these moments are not detours from healing. They are the healing. And if we work with them skillfully, they are beneficial. Each descent into the darkness carries the seed of wisdom waiting to emerge. If you'd like to learn more about how my team facilitates legal psilocybin macrodose journeys in Oregon, you can check out our website at www.meadowmedicine.org. We do see clients from all 50 states and internationally. And if you found value in this video, please don't forget to like, subscribe, comment, and share. It helps our channel to grow. And don't forget to follow me for more down-to-earth education about psychedelics.